This is Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast. We're here once again at Nutmeg Studios with our engineer, Frank Verderosa. Our guest this week is an actor, producer, writer, director, activist, and a good old-fashioned Hollywood leading man, and a movie star you know from his many TV appearances such as Craft Theater, Playhouse 90, Police Story, How the West Was Won, The Outcast, Hotel, Matlock, Wings, Murder, She Wrote, Knots Landing, and the recent revival of Twin Peaks. But it was his work on the big screen where he made his most indelible mark in popular movies like A Hatful of Rain, Shake Hands with the Devil, Advise and Consent, Baby the Rain Must Fall, Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, Deadly Hero, Endless Love, Peggy Sue Got Married, and his pet project, The Hoodlum Priest, and his film debut, Bus Stop, opposite the legendary Marilyn Monroe. In an acting career that started back to the early 1950s, he shared the screen with Hollywood's biggest stars such as Steve McQueen, Henry Fonda, Helen Hayes, James Cagney, Alan Ladd, Anthony Quinn, and Charles Lawton, as well as some of the greatest character actors of the last half century, including Jason Robots, Burgess Meredith, James Earl Jones, Martin Balsam, Roddy McDowell, Jack Warden, E.G. Marshall, and Eli Wallach, to name a few. He's also been the subject of a recent documentary entitled Don Murray, Unsung Hero, about his extraordinary experiences in and out of show business. Please welcome to the podcast one of the great actors of his generation and a man who says he wanted to be Danny Kay when he grew up, Don Murray. <laughs> never quite made it. <laughs> you never quite made it being, Don, being Danny Kay? No, never got, got to the fame of Danny Kay. Why did you want to be Danny Kay, Don? Because he was the ultimate of what I like to do. He liked, he made people laugh, and also he sang and he danced, and and that's what I like best of everything. Even though I've had very little opportunity to do musicals, that the musical theater is my first love. But you'd you'd be uh, happy to know that we've spoken to a few people who worked with Danny Kay. More than a few, yeah. Yeah, and as much as they all had nothing but great things to say about him as a talented performer, they hated him as a person. (laughs) Not not everyone. (laughs) Well, in in that case, I'm glad I didn't end up like any any fan. Joyce Van Patten, you know that that actress? Sure. Uh, Don, she was on the Danny Kaye show, and she liked him quite a bit, so she was the exception to the rule. But he he had a a bit of a difficult reputation. Uh Huh? I think it was wonderful on the screen anyway. Yeah. So all the all the millions of people around the world didn't know him as being difficult. They just knew him as being very entertaining. Oh, sure. Sure, and, court jester. And, and I got to tell you a personal story that'll mean nothing to anybody except me. And that's that I remember over the years watching TV with my parents. And whenever you popped up in a movie... My father always said, oh, he was in that movie, The Hoodlum Priest. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I'm glad to remember that one because that's the one that I wrote and produced as well as acted in. So I'm happy when people remember that. So I, I wish my father was alive just so I could say to him, I'm interviewing the guy from The Hoodlum Priest. 
I wish he was alive, too. I can use all the fans I can get. Yeah. <laughs> I like it, Tom. <laughs> now, you started off actually as a promising athlete. Well, uh, I luckily, uh, I never, I was too small when I was in high school to play uh, football successfully. I was on the football team, but I was strictly a bench rider. Uh, but I got to be, uh, actually, I had some success as an athlete uh, once I got to be 17 years old and I was played semi-pro basketball. And uh, I went on, as a matter of fact, the best thing that I ever did is I won the very last Crosby golf tournament. Oh. Which is... That's uh, impressive. <laughs> did you turn that down uh, athletic scholarships, Don? Uh, I never had any offer for uh, athletic scholarships, uh, what I did is I turned down going to college, uh, and I went to dramatic school instead at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. Mm -hmm. and I'm very happy about that because uh, that really started my, my career uh, in almost a professional way because it was great great uh, academy. Who, who, was, who was there? With, who was studying with you well, at that time? Well, class, my class was Jason Robards. And Don Rickles. Wow. Oh, my How God. How about that? How about that? Wow. And, People forget you, Rickles was an actor. Yeah. And do you know that Rickles was invited back for the senior year and uh, Jason Robards wasn't? Oh, so he, wow. Oh, boy. <laughs> something's wrong with that picture. <laughs> there, There's something wrong with the Academy's uh, uh, predictions on, <laughs> on talent. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't he in Run Silent, Run Deep? Rickles with, uh, with, was, oh, yeah. oh, with, with Clark with Gable. Gable. Yeah, I remember yeah. him in a lot of early roles. Yeah, but most of the time he's making millions of dollars for doing the same thing he got thrown out of class for at the Academy. About that. <laughs> in the last laugh. Now, you also <laughs> had a chance to join Actor Studio. And you said an interesting thing uh, that your reason for not joining was that when you'd see an actor light up a cigarette in the scene. Do you remember this? Yeah, the scene became about the cigarette <laughs> instead of about what the characters were feeling, what they're going, going through. Uh, I found, what, but the main reason I didn't join the studio is that uh, it was almost like talking to people who were religious fanatics. Interesting. Um, and... Uh, the uh, acting, of course, is, a, is not just uh, a business. It's, it's mainly an art form. But in, in an art form, uh, it's, it's still an art form, an entertainment. It's not religion. So uh, people that uh, get involved in it and uh, talk about anybody who doesn't act in their method is sort of uh, almost sacrilegious and uh, they're not worthy of uh, consideration. So you rejected and, that. They were a little too dogmatic about it, and their their approach. Yeah, I, I as far found as you that, were concerned. That, 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 that so many of the actors that I worked with that were actors studio actors had those kind of attitudes, and uh, I never liked that. So I I didn't enjoy it. Yeah, those actors who say, "Oh, that's the Strasburg method. The better method is the Adler or the Stanislavski." <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's right. Yeah, but uh, what is what is really the only real method is to uh, uh, listen and talk and react honestly to the material you're working on, mm -hmm. what you're given. And mainly, my acting method was uh, I got my performance from the eyes of the other actors. That's why I always had to see an actor if I'm doing a close up. I would not do a close up just to a camera or someone. I had to have the actor there and look in his eyes or her eyes and and react to what I see, not only to the dialogue that I'm Interesting. speaking. Interesting. Now, what did you do if you were with an actor who didn't have something in their eyes? Well, there's something that Ilya Kazan used to say, whatever happens, use it. And that's what I would do. I would use it if someone was was not really reacting to me, I used that as part of the character. I used the, the, the character of trying to get that other actor to really pay attention to what I was saying to him. And uh, 
So I, I would use that. I would use perhaps a frustration within my own character uh, at what was not coming back from from the other side of the camera. But uh, it would always have to be from a basis of reality. Never uh, faked anything. Always felt what uh, what I was saying. When you when you left the academy, uh, uh, Don, you 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 started doing some live television. Yes, I did. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, which was some Gilbert read a couple of them: Philco TV Playhouse, Craft Theater, U.S. Steel Hour, Stu- uh, yeah. Studio One. What what was that experience? We've had a couple of actors in here. We had Barbara Barry here, uh, a couple of people who did uh, Lee Grant. A couple of people who did live television. What was the experience like for you? Terrifying and wonderful. <laughs> Terrifying and wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Terrifying in that uh, you, like a Broadway play, you had to know all the dialogue and be completely familiar and comfortable within the character. But you had very much less time to work on it than you did in Broadway because the rehearsal periods were much shorter. So that's, that's why I say terrifying. Because you didn't have that much preparation and you were alive. And when uh, accidents would happen, for instance, a, a camera would get into the shot, there's no take two. That's it. The camera is in the shot. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're, 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 you're doing Billy Budd back in uh, the 18th century, and there's a modern camera going through the shot. <laughs> there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> nothing you can do. You did, you did Lux Video Theater. It was a, a Rod Serling story. Did you know Serling, by the way? Had you met him? Yes. What was mm-hmm. he like? Well, of course, just a, a towering talent. Uh, just a, a wonderful man and very appreciative what actors did. Uh, and he gave actors wonderful roles to play. It was a shame that he died so young. Yeah, chain smoker, I believe. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and every Twilight Zone, he had a cigarette when he was <laughs> introducing it. Everybody was smoking on camera in those days. Yeah, they, they, they were. As a matter of fact, uh, you do a scene in a movie, and they have all the extras light up, so you get smoke in the in the shot. They like that that. Uh, Feeling that smoke, you know, oh, like, so, almost like fog would give you. So they had extra smoking to give more of a, a mood look to the film? Exactly. Wow. Fascinating. Fascinating. I didn't know that. That's pretty oh, cool. my God. That's pretty cool. <laughs> We're looking at yeah. some of these actors you work with in live television, Don, too. Charlton Heston, E.G. Marshall, Fred Gwynn, Jack Warden, who you would go on to work with a bunch of times, Kim Hunter, Martin Balsam. What an exciting time for all of you, young actors. It was an exciting time, and all those people you mentioned helped to make it exciting. And you just can't wait to get on the set in the morning to to be with these people and creating something by someone like Rod Serling. That was really great living. And do you remember any stories about Jack Warden or... Uh... You know, even Gilbert got to do a movie with Jack yes. Warden, Don. You have that in common. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. He was in, in the movie Bachelor Party with Jack Warden. Uh, there was a scene where we're supposed to be watching a pornographic movie. And, of course, they don't show any of the pornographic movie. They would today, but in those days they couldn't. And uh, we and Patty Chesky, the author, told us to uh, ad-lib our reaction to what we're seeing. And uh, so we had several ad-libs, and the best would come from Jack Warden, when one of the characters, Larry Bryden, says, oh, well, you've seen one, you've seen them all. And Jack Warden says, yeah, want to wanna run them backwards? <laughs> <laughs> that, was my, that was one of my favorite great ad lives. <laughs> he seemed like a real character. And what, and oh, he was. What an actor. Yeah. I mean, the range. He was, and he, he did everything. Terrific, he was a terrific actor. I love the story he tells about... You know, he had a, a real thick New York accent you know, him, himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, he went in to read for King Lear, the great Shakespearean play. <laughs> and so the English director, he comes in with his New York accent, and the English director got so perplexed that he said, uh, well, Mr. Wooden, uh, how, how do you see yourself? Or what, would, what would you do? In, in the Shakespearean drama. And he said, well, who's playing Leah? 
This is so funny, Don, because <laughs> last week I was interviewing someone and I remembered that story. Oh and I told God. that story on the air. But to hear um, it from you <laughs> is amazing. Well, I hear it from you. Now I know it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everything Gilbert says on this show is true. Don. Oh, yeah. <laughs> T- tell us about getting cast in Bus Stop and, and how it happened. And that, that was kind of a big break for you. I mean, certainly as far as movies are concerned. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I had been actually offered movie contracts from the time I was 19, but I always turned them down mm-hmm. because they, they entailed a uh, what I call a slave contract, where for seven years you could only work for that studio and uh, you had to play whatever, whatever parts they offered you. Right. So so I turned that down uh, uh, several times. But when it got to bus stop, Joshua Logan, the director, had seen me on Broadway in a play called The Skin of Our Teeth by Thornton Wilder, mm-hmm. the great author of our town. And um, I was playing uh, the character that's like uh, a Hitler Jugend or... Uh, you know, the, the terrible uh, killers of the world is what I play, the real, really bad guy. But uh, Josh Logan saw the energy in that, and he thought that he could apply that energy to the comedy in Bus Stop. So he uh, insisted on screen testing me. And I thought I was totally wrong for a part. I never I played a part like that before. You're a New York kid who never rode a horse. Yeah, that's right. It never ever <laughs> rode a horse. Is right, <laughs> just a hobby horse. And uh, anyway, I thought I kept on all through the screen test saying, "Josh, uh, you know, I don't know, I have any idea how to play this crazy cowboy. Uh, you know, why, I, I, I'm just wrong for this. This is silly for me to even be doing the screen test." And he said, "Shut up! I'll tell you what you're right for." <laughs> wow. <laughs> And thank God he did. Uh, as a matter of fact, my performance in Bus Stop was more to Josh Logan's performance than my own. All I did is I did everything he told me to do, and uh, and, that, and, that, and it worked out very well for both of us. But it was really a, a Joshua Logan performance, not a Don Murray one. And and you, of course, worked with Marilyn Monroe in that. Yeah, what a what a thrill that was. Uh, yeah, she she was remarkable. Um, that was her comeback film. She left movies and started acting at the Actors Studio for a year, and this was her comeback film. So we had the pl- press around us all the time. It was uh, it was like uh, working in a fishbowl, uh, and uh, people who did uh, other films for her throughout her career, like uh, uh, Whitey, her makeup man, Wade Schneider, he said that Bus Stop was her best behaved movie. But her best behaved movie, she was still like uh, two or three, four hours late every day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she she uh, took a week off in the middle of the filming and uh, she was supposed to have uh, been uh, home with the flu. But actually she was having a romance with uh, Arthur Miller, a great playwright. Interesting. Uh, in the Chateau Maman Hotel in, in Hollywood when she was supposed to be on the set. So she delayed uh, the production for yeah, her personal yeah, she, life. She did, yeah. And uh, she had a very, very diffi- great deal of difficulty sustaining a scene. She'd just get into a scene and and forget, forget the line or forget the, some, some actions she was supposed to do. So you had to do take after take after take. And I learned in the very first day, uh, after people that had done movies that were uh, Broadway actors said, oh, your movies are easy. If you don't get on take one, it take two, or take three, whatever. Yeah, if uh, Marilyn Monroe uh, doesn't get it right, you do take two and right on to take 20 and so on. But as long as she gets through the scene... That's one they're going to print. So you better be at your best in every take because whatever you do, when she's done her best work, that's what's going to be in the movie. So it was very, very difficult to do my first movie 
under those circumstances. Wow. And she was training with Lee Strasberg. And then didn't she take Paula Strasberg, Lee's wife, with her on every movie she worked on? Yes, but Joshua Logan uh, would encourage Marilyn to work with Paula, but off the set, and I did it, you know, on the sound stage, but off near the doors, not on the on the set, where uh, where we the uh, people were setting up the scene, and uh, they they did that very successfully. As a matter of fact, I think Paula uh, she gets uh, she gets in trouble in uh, the movie My Week with Marilyn, uh, with her uh, working with Marilyn on the set, uh, which Olivia uh, was very perturbed about. But Logan encouraged her to work with Paula, but not w w where we were working on the set, off to the side. It's, it's so fascinating. That, Go ahead. I'm, so, yeah, I'm so sorry, their, Don. Their, co their collaboration was very, uh, very, very valuable. As a matter of fact, uh, I th and when I watched that film, you know, in in light, later years, I realized that she was so wonderful. Marilyn was so wonderful in Bus Stop that she definitely deserved to have an Oscar, because that was really definitely the best performance by a female actor of of the year, I believe. You you guys have great chemistry in the picture. I just watched it again. Oh, and, good. And it's interesting. And a couple of things. One, her performance is great. I agree with you. Uh, it's interesting too. I heard you say she had perfect skin, but she got so anxious that she would break out in hives on camera. That's would, absolutely would, right. She had skin like a baby's, uh, you know, and she'd walk on the set and you say, wow, you're just so smooth and so just perfect pink, uh, uh, complexion. And then as soon as the, the cameras start rolling, she'd break out in a, in a rash. And particularly, fortunately, not on her face, but what happened on her neck and her chest. And I'd have to dab her with a, a white makeup uh, to, to hide the rash. And it was all from nerves. Because Imagine that. As soon as, the, as soon as they said cut, it would go away. And as soon as they said roll them, it would come back again. And, and one thing they said that made me think like any guy back then would have paid to have been on the set when, this, when they were filming this scene. She was in bed. And she's supposed to be naked under the blankets, and she actually was naked. Yeah, that was funny because uh, Josh Logan said to me, Don, look, uh, Marilyn, you know, she's in her own emotions, and she keeps on um, moving around in the bed and exposing herself. And so the scene's going to end up in the cutting room floor if we don't solve this problem. So when you see that she's trying to, she's not trying to, but you see when... She's revealing accidentally what should not be revealed, what would be cut out. Just uh, reach down and, and tuck the sheet in around her. And, uh, I said, well, won't that be seen in the shot? He said, no. He said, I'll be cutting in close enough so we won't see your hands doing that. So all through the film, uh, I was whenever we had an intimate scene together, I was doing things like trying to hide her her bare buttocks or <laughs> her, bre her, her breast and, <laughs> and and also uh, when she'd, she'd get off her, her marks and she'd get out of focus and everything, uh, Logan would have me put my hands on her hips and move her back onto her marks. So I was, I was doing this, uh, playing my first movie in a cowboy accent when I'm a New Yorker <laughs> and I'm taking my movie star and pushing around and moving around Amazing. to her, her marks while I'm doing scenes with her. You know, it, so you were one of the luckiest bastards <laughs> in the world. <laughs> <laughs> You're basically fee getting paid to feel up Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? It is. I end up, I end up, today I'm in, in jail for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that scene where you get up on the barroom table and you quiet everybody down. And by the way, I'd seen it years ago. I didn't know that you were a, a New York guy, that you weren't from that part of the country. I mean, I totally bought it. It's a credit to you as an actor. <laughs> that, that, that you, you know, when you see a movie as a young person, you don't think of those things. Gee, where is that actor from? You just, <laughs> you just, you know, you suspend disbelief. 
And I o- always right. bought you guys together. I always thought you had great chemistry in that movie. Oh, good. I, I, well, I felt very comfortable with that because, uh, uh, like, he's fascinated with, yeah. with uh, her character, with Sherry, and I was fascinated with, uh, with Marilyn, so I just used my own emotions. <laughs> My name is Beauregard Dick, I'm the am. I'm 21 years old and I own my own ranch up in Timber Hill, Montana, where I got a fine herd of Hereford cattle, a dozen horses, and the finest sheep and hogs and chickens in the country. Now, I'll come down for the rodeo tomorrow with the idea in mind of finding me an angel. And you're it. Now, I don't have a whole lot of time for sweet talking around the bush, so I'd be much obliged to you if you just step outside with me into the fresh air. Well, what'd you say? My name is Beauregard Decker, ma'am. I'm 21 years old, and I own my own ranch up in Timber Hill, Montana, where I got yes, a fine... I, I know I heard all that part. Okay, let's get out of here. No, uh, I'm, I'm mighty grateful to you for what you did, but uh, we're, we're not allowed to go out with the customers. But you could buy me a drink if you wanted. I'm so dry, I'm spitting cotton. And isn't it that scene where you're standing on the table, if I'm not mistaken. He's quieting everybody in the room. Yeah, now. and you say, well, start your yammering. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I love is there's a promo for that movie. The studio promo was uh, introducing Hollywood's newest hunk of man, Don Murray. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what kind of a hunk of man I was in. Uh, I did that. I, I was in a forerunner of the Peace Corps for two and a half years. Yeah. And uh, I had uh, gotten a very bad case of infectious hepatitis. And I was, uh, I'd lost weight. I got down uh, from 185 pounds to 140 pounds. And when I started bust up, I still had the effects of that uh, that uh, hepatitis. So uh, they they put a, under my shirt, they put a big heavy wool sweater to make me look bigger and huskier. Oh, that's that's a good secret. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, that's why I, when I read those ads, uh, Hunk of Man, I said, oh, my God, are you kidding? A hunk of Man, this is a, uh, it's a hunk of, uh, of dried uh, beef. <laughs> <laughs> now, and you always... You had chances. I guess the studio was pushing you to go, okay, he's a good cowboy hero. That's what, and you didn't want any of that. No, as a matter of fact, I always wanted to do the opposite of what I did before. And I got great great criticism from my agents about that. They said, you have to establish your personality and do that personality over and over again. That's what the audience, that's what makes movie stars. And so I said, well... He said, if you want to be an actor, go back to Broadway. But if you want to be a movie star, you develop a Don Murray personality. And I said, well, if I, if I had to choose between being a personality or an actor, I'll choose an actor any day. So if I'm, I'm not acceptable in, in changing roles all the time, then I won't go back to Broadway. So my second film, I, I chose, uh, instead of the wild cowboy, I, go, I chose the very introverted uh, accountant, New York accountant. Right, the Chayefsky. Chayefsky's bachelor party. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, a New York News uh, critic, I think it was Kay Gardello, um, she, she said, well, Don Murray has a little bit too much of the wide open spaces in him to be believable as a New Yorker. <laughs> Riley! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So I said, well, well, that made me feel good about my performance and bus stop. <laughs> I was able to fool people into thinking I was a cowboy. Yeah. Because I was the last thing from a cowboy. Also, the great Carolyn Jones turns up in that movie. Oh, yeah. She yeah. was wonderful. Yeah, that whole cast was, was wonderful, that whole ensemble cast. Yeah, wasn't it? She was nominated for an, I know, for a small, for what, what turned out to be a small part. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you were in the movie Advice and Consent. One of my favorites. It's a good one. And can you tell us the cast of that movie? Well, it was uh, Charles Lawton and Henry Pigeon and Burgess Meredith. And, uh, oh, Henry Fonda. Henry Fonda. Right. Uh, 
Will, Will Gear. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. Gene, Gene Tierney. Gene Tierney, uh, right. So I had a, had a great cast, and Otto Preminger did a wonderful uh, directing job. And I, over the years, it's been appreciated more than when it first came out. Uh, some important critics uh, thought it was too uh, critical and showed our government in a bad light, but actually showed the government in a very honest light. Oh, there, there are people who are unscrupulous and people who are very scrupulous in, in government, just as they really are. And uh, But I think that that hurt the film at the beginning, but then as years go by, even those critics who were critical of when it first came out came around and realized what a wonderful work of, of art and also what a wonderful social documentary it was. About, it holds up very uh, well, and it's time, works. obviously, it's timelier than ever. Yeah, isn't it? It's yeah. really very Political timely, corruption yeah. never seems to go out of style. <laughs> <laughs> no. And, and you played, your character was based on an actual person. Yes, it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Lester Hunt, who who was uh, who was a target of McCarthy. I didn't realize that's who it was. Yes, uh, well, really? according to my research, anyway, a, 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 a senator from Wyoming who was driven to commit suicide. Oh my goodness! Wow. Yeah, I could be wrong, or the internet no, could be wrong, Don. No, yeah, I'm I'm sure you're right. I just wasn't aware of that. And you played a homosexual in that. Well. You, you know what? It's funny because uh, he played a. Uh, my character had had a aff- uh, homosexual affair when he was uh, over in the army, serving in the Pacific, at a very isolated, lonely time, and then he went back and and uh, lived his life uh, as a het- heterosexual. Had a wife, he was in love with, had children, and so on. So when people, I remember, at a big. Uh, uh, press uh, conference in Washington uh, when they, they asked me what it was like to play uh, a homosexual. I said, well, why do you call him a homosexual? Uh, it was a guy that just had one affair. I said, if uh, President Kennedy hits a one golf ball, do you call him a golfer? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good analogy. <laughs> Or, that's funny. Other actors shied away from the part because I, I, I always I always assumed the character was bisexual. Yeah, he's in a relationship with a woman, but I, I guess it's that's open to interpretation. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, but 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 other actors turned down the part because of the because of the gay content, and and that didn't dissuade you at all. You wanted to not take a all. chance as with a the material. Of, not, as a matter of fact, I thought uh, they actors are people would think they were gay, uh, you know, and uh, yeah. I, I said, uh, I don't care if they think I'm gay because maybe all these beautiful women will try to cure me. <laughs> <laughs> Hell of a plan. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you got along with Preminger. I mean, we were talking about Danny Kay, but Otto Preminger is another uh, a person whose reputation hated. preceded him a little bit. Yeah, people hated yeah. him. Yeah, I got along fine with him. What I found that with uh, with uh, Otto Preminger is that uh, I would I would always kid him, and he would he was reluctant to attack me because I would always turn around and make it a, a joke about him. I see. So he was he was very careful about uh, not doing that. As a matter of fact, my um, my wife uh, Betty Johnson, she was one of New York Top's models, and she was visiting on my us on the set and and uh, we weren't married at the time <clears throat> and uh, she uh, had a cover of Nicole's magazine that came out when we were shooting uh, in the hotel scene in, in Washington and uh, out of premise you saw her on the cover of McCall's and, it, and then I introduced her to him and he said Miss Johnson, I want you to be in my movie. And she said, no problem. I'm not, no, Otto, I'm not going to bring you in the movie. He said, why not? I said, because. I said, you yell at the actors. I wouldn't like people yelling at me. He said, well, I never yell at the actors. I just yell at the crew. 
And I said, yeah, like uh, Henry Fonda, the makeup man, Charles Lawton, the chief grip. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was working? This Lawton's last picture, by the way. Yeah, so Advise and consent. Can you, can you tell us uh, something about him? Something about your experience of the man? We, well, we, lo yeah. we love Night of the Hunter, which I think the one time he directed. And he was the best Quasimodo. And, of course, The Hunchback and much other wonderful work. Yeah, and the most amazing thing you make you mentioned my uh, Night of the Hunter, which is a, a brilliant movie. Yeah, we love it. And he never got to direct another movie. Isn't that and weird? That, that killed him. He absolutely would love to direct other movies, and that movie was a, a classic. It's considered it's a masterpiece today. today. It is a masterpiece, and yeah. he never got to do another one. Which Strange. Was very very sad uh, to him. No, he was very, uh, he was just very gracious and very, very self-effacing. Uh, I, I remember uh, <laughs> they were a uh, makeup man, uh, someone said, uh, powder his, his face, face shine, take the shine off. And he said, oh, it doesn't matter what you do to my face, it will still look like an elephant's ass. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. And, and you worked with an actor whose name only pops up on this podcast. And he had two names. One was Max Showalter, and the other was Casey Adams. You remember him, Don? I remember him very well. He played a reporter. Right. Uh, on, the, on the show. And he, he was just, he's a wonderful actor. He just had such energy and such commitment to whatever part he played. And yeah, he did have... Uh, He's in Bus Stop. Uh, two names. Yeah. 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 In Bus Stop. By the way, I, I think Advise and Consent was the first gay bar scene in a Hollywood picture. Yeah, that, I think it was. That, and that scene where you come into the bar is 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 a wonderful piece of acting, in my in my humble opinion. Well, thank you. It was uh, very easy to do because uh, they had it set up, you know, real, and, and to walk into it. Uh, a bar where everybody at the bar are men. There's not one woman there, you know. And to walk in that and to act that scene, it it made it it was so real that it made it be very very made it very easy for me to have the reaction I did. As a matter of fact, that Bremiger realized that what was going to happen at my reaction. So he didn't rehearse the scene. He shot it right from the first beginning. So he'd get my reaction to what I was seeing for the first time. And, and that's what he used. Right. It's, it's heartbreaking because you realize by reading your face that he still finds himself attracted to men when he, when he walks <laughs> into the bar. Yeah. You realize the, this, the painful realization for him. Yes, Exactly. And and when you did another movie, Hatful of Rain, and it's another good one, and you also acted with an actor that I'm, um, I can also brag I acted with, uh, and that was Bill Hickey. Oh, Bill Hickey! Oh, Bill Hickey was a wonderful actor. He played my uncle Carlton in an episode of Wings, which is a show Don has oh, also yeah. done. Oh, oh my yeah. God! Yeah. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about Cagney, Don, about working with uh, the great James Cagney and oh, Shake Hands with the Devil. That was a thrill for me. Uh, Jack, uh, James Cagney, uh, I loved him for not for his uh, shoot him up and uh, kill people in the god trunk, but for Yankee Doodle Dandy and also mm -hmm. for The Fighting 69th, the World War One movie. And in, in the Fighting 69th, uh, my my uncle was in the real Fighting 69th in uh, World War One, and he got a Purple Heart for being gassed in France. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had that association with uh, with Cagney from from that uh, picture. And uh, when when we were on the set, I would in between takes I would do exercises like you know, push ups and sit ups and stuff like that. And Cagney would dance. That was his exercise. Now, that's how he would he dance while shape. you did push-ups. Yeah, yeah. That was his exercise. And he did that all through the film in between takes. 
Uh, it was really quite remarkable to watch. I loved to, I loved his dancing. I described his dancing as a a bear cub uh, being pushed and bouncing down a staircase. <laughs> a bear cub being bounced <laughs> being bounced down a staircase. <laughs> I saw an interview with you, Don, and you said, this is interesting, you said he was embarrassed by his gangster pictures. Did you know that? He was. Uh, yeah, I had heard that. He thought of himself as a song and dance man. That's what he loved. And uh, I said to him, uh, I said, how come you don't do more musicals? And he said, because that's what I was trained for. He says, it's like going in the Army, whatever you're trained for, to have you doing something else. And he said... Uh, uh, how about you? You from a farm and uh, you a real cowboy? And I said, no, only hobby horses, the only horses I rode. And he said, well, you see what I mean? He said, that's Hollywood. Whatever you don't do, that's what you'll be doing in, a, in movies. And you worked with an actor, a busy actor back then, who died in the most frightening way. And that was Albert Decker. Do you remember? you remember him? Yes, I remember him very well. Very big husky guy. And how did he die? The police. Uh, I guess there was a smell coming from the apartment. And the police broke into the apartment. Albert Decker was hanging in the shower, bound and gagged, with his hands tied behind his back. Yeah, true. And oh. obscene drawings all over his body, and the police called it a suicide, and that oh was it. God. Oh, yeah. my God. I never knew that story. Yeah. Wow. Sorry to take the show in a strange direction, Don. Oh, well, you know, that, that reminds me, and, and then a, a terrible murder was Sal, Sal Minio. Yeah, in West Hollywood. He was stabbed to death, yeah. Yeah. When he was with me, uh, in uh, the Rose Tattoo on Broadway, right? He he, he played one of the little little boys in that, and uh, there there's a book of cartoons by a cartoonist named Steig, and uh, it's each page of the book had a different drawing of a of a personality, a person, not a real person, imagine a person. And uh, I asked everybody in the cast to write, to sign their name to the character that meant most to them in, in their own life. And he signed the character uh, where he was being stabbed with a used by a knife wow. in, his, in his back. He was being killed by a knife, and he himself was actually killed by a knife. That's weird. Yeah. That's very eerie. And was Sal Mineo one of those, like, tortured souls that they uh, always... Yeah, I think I think he, he was. I think he, he was a very, very, actually a very good actor. And, of course, he had an association with James Dean. And um, he uh, he was got to be, uh, you know, a, a real fan favorite of young, of young people. Let's ask you about Hatful of Rain, which we brought up before, and you work with the great Fred Zinnemann. But, but this is also interesting, is that the story was written by Michael V. Gozzo, who was known to audiences as Frankie Five Angels in Godfather 2. Yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. And people did, I don't think people, many people know he was a writer. Yeah. And it's a wonderful piece yeah. of work. These FBI guys say... Michael Corleone did this. Michael <laughs> Corleone did that. Did that. <laughs> I said, sure. Man. <laughs> but That's very you're, good. you're terrific in that as Johnny Pope. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, when they bought that, they uh, Buddy Adler, the head of 20th Century Fox, when I was in a set of uh, Bus Stop, he said, I bought a movie for you. And I said, oh, really? Which one? He said, uh, it's a Broadway show. Uh, it's called uh, A Hatful of Rain, and I had seen it. Now, they bought it for me to play Polo, the comedy part right. that uh, Francioso played. And uh, uh, when uh, when we were about to start rehearsal with director Fred Zinnemann, he said, I think you make a wonderful Polo. I said, I don't want to play Polo. I want to play the dope addict. 
And he said, well, God, everybody took it for granted. You're going to play the comedy part. And I said, that's why I want to play the dope addict, because I want to do the opposite of what people expect. So uh, luckily, Logan's, I mean, uh, Fred Zinnemann said, well, if you want to play the dope addict, you're the dope addict. So that's, that's how that came to be. And Tony Franciosa, who played Polo in it and had, had the comedy in the show, he was nominated for an Oscar. For how about it. that? And, and he won the Best Actor Award at the Venice Film Festival from, that, from his role in that movie. Everybody's good in that. Henry Silver is very scary as, as, the, as oh, the drug pusher, as a mother. Henry's- Still with us, by the way, Henry Silver. Yes, I'm glad to hear that. Henry, we, I love Henry Silva. He's just a wonderful human being. And <laughs> this evil guy is one of the nicest guys you could ever imagine. And you worked with Rod Steiger. Yeah. Oh, on Happy Birthday, Wanda June. Happy Birthday, Wanda June, exactly. What was Steiger like to, to, to spend time with and to work with? Well, he was uh, very, very... Uh, Serious, of course, very dedicated to his art. He's just a wonderful actor. Uh, and uh, he was he was especially uh, friendly uh, with with me. I, I found him like a like a, a real pal on, on, on the set. It was a comedy and uh, I was to I wanted to play the part of the vacuum cleaner salesman which was a, a very funny part. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, I, I don't see you in comedy, Mark Ripson said, the director. And I said, well, do you see Bust Up? He said, oh, yeah. He said, that, that's fine. But you, you've done drama since. I only think he was a drama, a dramatic actor. So I said, well, I'll come in and see you. And so what I did is I found an old rusty vacuum cleaner in the cellar of my house. And I took that rusty vacuum cleaner and I walked into his office put it down his table and proceeded to sell him the rusty vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and I had him laughing so far hard that he finally said, okay, okay, I give up, you got the part. <laughs> nice work. <laughs> you had a quote that one time they asked, I think it was Betty Grable, uh, how to make it in show business. And I think her quote was something like, well, take fountain, and that's the quickest way from Beverly Hills to Hollywood or something. <laughs> but that's very if funny. I would ask you how to make it in show business, what would your advice be? Are you trying to make it in show business? Yeah, <laughs> too, too late for me. <laughs> well, I, I got to ask you the same thing, but I'm sure you've told people. So I'll tell you how to make it in show business. Number one... Uh, realize that you're going into something that statistically your chance of success are practically nil. Mm-hmm. So know that going into it right away. So that since you're s- starting from below scratch, we all are, be thankful for any bit of show business that you're able to uh, accomplish or any position you're, you're able to achieve, whether you play your life doing bit parts or you become so-called star, uh, still give it all and get the most that you can out of whatever you've been given. And the most thing, most important thing is to realize that there are many other actors in the world, but there's no other you, that you are unique. And in the course of life, you are unique and irreplaceable. Just keep that in mind whenever you're rejected for a part. And uh, just if that's what you really want to do, just keep going and keep going and uh, keep your heart in it and do the best you can. That's great advice. You know, uh, you remember the actor Billy Barty, Don? Oh, oh I sure do. Well, did you know <laughs> Gil? Did you know... <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> Gilbert lost yeah, a part did, to him. He, he didn't make it on my basketball team. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was once up for a part in a movie. Mel Brooks movie. Yeah, and they were they liked my, my audition. 
And then at the last minute, I found out they're not going with you. They're going with Billy Barty. <laughs> <laughs> so you could have used some of Don's advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Tell us about playing a bad guy in uh, in Conquest of the Planet of the Apes because that you you didn't play too many uh, SOBs in your career and you were very scary in that role. Oh, Governor Brecht in yeah, Brecht. Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, he was no villain. He was trying to save the Earth from being run over by apes. <laughs> oh, I see. He was a good guy. <laughs> Hero, he shows what happens when you're soft on apes. <laughs> <laughs> you you were friends with Roddy McDowell too, weren't you? Yeah, we were buddies in New York uh, before years before we did that. I was uh, his friend during a time when he was really struggling. Uh, his career as a child star was over, mm -hmm. and he hadn't established really a career. Uh, as a young leading man, and he was having a terrible, difficult time doing it. And as a matter of fact, what his big break was of all things is in a musical. He played uh, the, uh, the villain uh, in uh, in uh, Camelot on mm -hmm. Broadway, mm -hmm. and and that that's what really brought him back to prominence again. What a fun actor! Oh yeah, he was, and he was a good guy. He was a good human being. Could watch him in anything. Yeah, it's true. He was wonderful as a pape, as the ape, where he created that character. Oh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. And, and it, it took him three hours to put that makeup on every day. And then for lunch, he had to just sip liquids through a straw. So I always had fun having a big, juicy sandwich. Or, or <laughs> in front drinking. of him. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Always did that every chance I could. <laughs> <laughs> Let's ask Don Quick about about Hoodlum Priest, which was which was your passion project. And and doing the research on this, I went down a rabbit hole and found out all this crazy stuff about the making yeah. of the movie. Not only you at war with the director ultimately, but but the priest himself uh, uh, that the that the picture was based on, that the story was based on, uh, would end up becoming something of a nuisance, which puts well, a very strange spin on this on the on the story. Well, first, when we come down to the director, we we didn't have any uh, arguments during the right. uh, filming of it. It was only in the cutting stage, and I think that's very typical of uh, directors uh, have, uh, by contract, they have the first cut, but they don't have the last cut. The producer has the last cut, usually, unless, it, you know, unless it's one of these super uh, directors who also producers uh and uh so when it came down to to, to cutting the film uh kirshner had his first cut uh, Irvin kirshner the director and then i had the, uh, the final cut and that's when he got very very disturbed and mm -hmm. d demanded to have his name move removed from the picture and fortunately i wouldn't remove his name i kept his name there and from that, he went on to do his Star Wars movie <laughs> and, and all the other good movies he, he made. He did okay. There was, yeah, all that came from bus stop. So uh, it's a good thing I, I didn't listen to him when he asked for his name removed. But uh, Father Clark, Father Charles Different Clark, the, the real priest, he was remarkable. And the, he had two things that were remarkable about him. Number one, character that I wrote was the real Father Clark. He talked exactly as I, as mm -hmm. I spoke. He, he talked like a hoodlum. And uh, he, he came up to me like when I first met him. I met him at a screening uh, in St. Louis of Shake Hands with the Devil, the, the Cagney movie. And uh, he came and sat next to me. He said, hey, listen, I ain't no square priest, you see, kid. <laughs> <laughs> And he was started talking to me during the movie. I said, well, Father, you know, I'm fascinated. I want to talk to you, but I haven't seen this movie yet, so could you come to the hotel tomorrow? Came to the hotel the next day, and he told me the story of his life. He said, I'd like you to maybe make a documentary of this. I said, no, I'm not gonna, I don't do documentaries. I'm going to make a real movie of it. So I, I just took his, his life and just stories he told me, and, and I, I wrote the movie. Uh, and uh, 
and when we were making the movie, uh, he was trying to uh, placate or uh, charm or whatever you want to call it, his financial backers for this halfway house that he was uh, building for uh, convicts that mm-hmm. had came out of jail with no place to to live and no job and so on. And at uh, halfway house takes care of them until they get on their feet. And uh, he would do things like oh, the, the big uh, blow up was when uh, there's a scene of I'm giving communion in jail. And it's after Father Clark has been accused of being a hoodlum himself and not being just a, a not just being a, a priest who acted like him, but was actually colluding with hoodlums. Uh, and uh, he, it was a scene where he's all alone and giving com- communion. And he came in with a young man and he said, this is uh, so-and-so and he's uh, so-and-so's son, one of my biggest backers, and he's going to play the altar boy. And I said, well, Father, there is no altar boy in the scene. It's taken from the real scene when you're here all by yourself and uh, you're down uh, you're, you're down at the you know, at the bottom uh, of of your emotions because you're being accused of all these these terrible things, and I uh, said so it's very important that you be all alone here, standing out. It's you against the world at this at this time. And he said, if you want to make the movie about a, a Protestant minister, you don't need no altar boy. But if you're going to make it about a hood bridge, you got to have an altar boy. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I just uh, I cut out the scene. I just didn't do the scene because it didn't make any sense to have the scene if he in the prison with an altar boy. Uh, it's 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 sort of the story of your career, uh, 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 Don. A little bit in a microcosm is that Hollywood was pushing you to be a, a, a big star, and you were interested a movie star, and you were interested in being an actor and making small stories and making personal stories that meant something to you. And that, that movie is a great example of that. Yeah, that's, that's a very good way of putting it. That, that's it exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and didn't care delay almost bleed to death during the making of the movie? It did. The scene in the movie where they're robbing the market, care delay and uh, Don Joslin to young hoodlums, uh, he breaks the window and he reaches inside to open the door and he cut his artery. I mean, it squirted his artery. It squirted from his wrist like a geyser. And wow. he really, uh, you know, he, he really uh, did lose uh, a considerable blood and, and it was a very dangerous situation. Uh, he was very brave about it. And as a matter of fact, he was back the next day after he got out of the hospital, he was back the next day working again. But that, that was really scary. I, I think that we were so lucky to get him uh, here to lay. Uh, he had never done a, 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 a real movie. He had done some television, but this was his first film. And uh, just for, uh, fortunately, the critics felt the same way as I did. I thought he was one of the best young actors I'd ever seen on, on the films. And, it's an uh, important film. Her critics thought so, you, too. It's about something. You know, uh, yeah, it's, and it's it's it was about something that was close to you, and it yeah. comes it comes through. It, it was, you know, you talk about being close to me because uh, when I worked in this group, Brethren Service, the forerunner of the Peace Corps, uh, I worked with refugees in these barbed wire camps over in mm-hmm. Nap- around the outskirts of Naples, Italy, and uh, the barbed wire camps were. You know, they were not prison camps, but they might as well have been in many ways because there were guards at the gate and you, they had to have a pass, the refugees, to go in and out. They couldn't uh, hold a job uh, even if they could find one. Uh, so they were very much living like prisoners. So uh, the kind of emotions that I felt from working with those refugees were the same kind of emotions I felt uh, for the young hoodlums and the hoodlum priests. And I transferred those emotions from one you know, from the reality of the life I lived there to uh, the film reality in the other mm-hmm. and and all of that can be seen in the, is the do, what's happening with that documentary with uh, with unsung hero. 
Uh, I don't. I don't know. I hope it's going to be shown uh, somewhere, <laughs> but I don't. I don't know what's happened to it. Because it's watch some of it online, and I was telling Gilbert, it's the story of what, what I just mentioned. It's the story of a man who was kind of pushed forward by the studio system, who rejected the studio system, and 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 wanted to do his own thing. I heard you described as a rebel with a cause, which I kind of <laughs> like. I like that too. <laughs> I yeah. thought that was good. Not my line, Not by right. the way. Yeah. And the last thing I wanted to say, Don, too, as we as we wrap uh, along those lines, and I, I don't know which friend of yours said uh, that Don is the kind of guy that could fall into a vat of manure and come out gold leaf. Oh, God, that was my best director at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. Uh, his name was uh, Peyton Price. And, Peyton uh, Price. And he w was my coach through all, all my career. And that's what he said. He said, you fall into a pile of manure and come up dripping gold leaf. <laughs> I like that You've, one. Y it's great. You did it your way, didn't you, Don? <laughs> well, I, I tried to. And in Hatful of Rain, you were actually studying junkies. Yeah. It's an interesting experience because uh, uh, it made me less sympathetic to junkies because they're so self-centered and so focused on the next fix that they tell you the stories how they just totally destroyed their families. But all they were really concentrating on is how they were suffering from not getting their fix. So uh, I wasn't really sympathetic to the, to, to the junkies. And uh, actually it worked best for, it worked for the film because uh, my character, Johnny, has such self-loathing for himself. He's so embarrassed and so chagrined and so tormented by his inability to deal with his uh, drug addiction. So that it really helped. My my attitudes to real junkies uh, helped in in playing that part. Good performance, you and you, Ava Marie Saint. That whole cast. Yeah. All right. So, this has been Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre, and I'm picturing my father standing here in front of me, <laughs> and I'm saying to him, I just interviewed the guy from Hoodlum Priest, <laughs> Don Murray. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, say to the, I say hi and thanks to the spirit of your father. Oh, thank you. What was your you. dad's name? Max. Max. Max Gottfried, a Don Murray fan. Don, this was a real treat for us. We really appreciate it. Well, thanks. I enjoyed talking to you. And I want to thank Jim Giordano and your son, Chris Murray, for putting this together, for help for helping find you and, you know, book you. Well, you, your son didn't have to find you. Yeah. <laughs> but to, <laughs> but to, to book you for this show, we really appreciate it. You, you've seen it all. You've done it all. And Mick helped your son set this up today. He's my youngest son. Oh, and Mick. I would want to thank Mick, too. Don, thanks for taking the time to do this for us. Oh, it's a pleasure. I enjoyed and it. And thanks for the years of entertainment. <laughs> thank thank you. you. And thank you for your years of entertainment, too. Oh, thank you very much. How about, that? Much. How about yeah. that? 